presenting on behalf of my co-author, uh, Angela, who's here and know much more about bicycle lessons than me. Talk about it. Um, for me, I came here to learn about mobility practice, trying to see what it can teach us for transportation planning. So that was also my critical question to the previous presentation. Because uh, what I'm working on in the presentation as part of the, that work is to base transportation planning on principles of justice. And I look at transportation planning, or transportation is one domain of government intervention, um, but one that actually lacks principles of justice. And when we look at other major fields of government intervention, whether it's housing, healthcare, education, you see that questions of justice are very fundamental to those policy terrains. And not in all countries, but in most developed countries it is. And but when we look at transportation, we don't really know what is due to everybody, what everybody deserves. And we basically see it as a technical exercise. So my own question, it is not only a technical exercise, definitely not. Um, so the work on cycling lessons is part of it bigger project. And so when you look at uh, transport or mobility um, from a justice perspective, it's basically a question of what is it for? What, why do we build transportation infrastructures? And we do so, of course, to enable people to participate in activities. Traveling might be nice for itself, but that in itself is not a reason to build these massive infrastructures which are out there. We do it so people can actually work, go to school, go to conferences visit their family and friends, and so forth. Now we can also assume that there's a kind of relationship between the accessibility we provide by transport infrastructures and the level of activity participation. The higher the accessibility we provide, the more people will participate in activities. The longer they will participate, the more further down, the further away they will participate in activities. But we also see when accessibility goes up, there will be a scattering of some people using it to the fullest, every minute of their life they will be spending on outdoor activities and others will be staying at home although they can travel. But we can also assume that at a certain point when accessibility goes down and transport facilities for you are very low, actually your activity participation goes down and goes down to such a level that you experience transport poverty or transport related social exclusion. And I think from a justice perspective, working on a book to make it more elaborate, these people should be the focus of our attention. That is what we are planning for. These people deserve more attention than they do now, and actually we should make sure that this doesn't exist, that actually everybody has sufficient accessibility or potential mobility to carry out their activities. Now, the cycle lessons are focusing on a group that is particularly vulnerable to a low level of activity participation. They're focusing on immigrant and refugee women uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, these groups are for various reasons at risk of low activity participation. It has to do with the language barrier, social cultural barriers, and financial barriers, a small social network, a lack of confidence, but it also has to do with a lack of mobility. And so what bicycle lessons do, among others, they have more goals than we just, just want, but it's actually to enhance their ability to travel through space, access places more easily. Um, so cycle lessons uh, have started in the late 80s and Angela has been working and developing them since 1991 and she's one of the leading experts in Holland and beyond that and also actually helping people in other countries to set up these kind of lessons. Um, and the basic idea of these lessons is to take these women um, through several stages so in the end they can actually cycle in traffic and access real destinations. And so it starts with getting acquainted with the bicycle, getting on the bike, learning to balance and so forth, to actually cycling on the bicycle and learning to cycle straight while looking left and right, uh, pointing directions and so forth, then making the step to actually learning how to cycle in traffic and the final stage in the ideal world would be to cycle with children if they have children to learn how to do that, which is a special skill. Now along the way, the key of this lesson is actually to also become confident that you can cycle, that you can do it. Because the main barrier to start to cycle is fear. Fear, direct fear of falling, of 
traffic, but also the fear of the consequences of having an accident. The consequences not just for you personally, but for your whole family. Because in many cases, these women are the person that keeps the family going, that take care of the kids, take care of the husband. And so when it, something happens to them, it actually means lots for the family. Uh, as word, uh, movies say more than a thousand of words, let's see if we can show you the movie that I think it works. Aside from this, it works. Made by Angela herself or not? Well, I didn't film it. Okay, it's not like you asked it. So you get an impression of how it works when people do. a safe place of course get to know the bicycle with Angela featuring explaining how you should start on your bicycle which is not easy and uh, at this moment of beginning you can fall any time and that's the most dangerous point of course once you get going it's fine if you have a cycle She's looking down, I guess that's what's wrong with Angela. Yeah. She should keep looking straight, she should keep your bike straight. Uh, All the natural tendencies you have if you don't know how to cycle, the way you stop it, you know, you panic and you use your legs. My little daughter does it also. Anyway, you get an impression on this. Okay, so I'm run. It's on the internet available on YouTube, so you can actually take it and can send it to them. Just for time's sake, so I will move on. So, that gives you an impression. So, small groups of women are instructed by somebody who is, of course, very competent in cycling, but also has the skills to communicate with women. They don't always speak the language, they come from different cultural backgrounds. So the instructors are usually women to make it are always made, so to make the barrier as low as possible. Um, now we, the presentation is based on a master thesis of a student of mine, which Angela also guided. And it was a simple uh, reasoning behind it. If people learn to cycle, they actually make it part of their choice set, which was discussed before in the presentation. It becomes part of their motility set. And if they can cycle the next three. They can keep cycling, uh, doing the same kind of activities, but actually reduce their time involved in traveling there. Instead of walking or using the inefficient bus system, they can cycle very efficiently. Or they can just get further away than by just walking, so they can enlarge their activity space and access new places. And if you have more time where you can access new places, you might actually in the end also participate in more activities. This was the idea of what we were testing. And so we interviewed 19 uh, people that either just passed their exam, the cycle test, or they were still busy doing the test. And there were women from eight different countries, and mostly uh, single women, uh, or mothers of children, so with children with dominance, and but also single in couples. Most in the low education level, some people didn't even go to secondary education, so no schooling whatsoever. And this has consequences for the way you have to teach them how to cycle. They're not used to being educated in any way. Um, for a, quite a variety in terms of age and when they move to Holland. Most were about a job, most of them for their husbands. Um, now what do you see? Because the first question of course, are we able to teaches women how to cycle and to ride a bike. And below the line you see the respondents who were still learning how to cycle. And you see, and so this is, the lower you are, the less able you are to cycle, and the higher up you are, the more you are able to cycle 
actually in everyday life. It is part of your life, it's a real option, it is something that's in your mind and you use it to go somewhere. Now you see that people who are still in the lessons obviously are not yet using their bicycles. And those respondents who did pass the exam, not all of them actually learned how to cycle properly. So they learned how to cycle in a protected environment, all of them, but not all of them were courageous enough or felt comfortable enough to actually cycle in traffic and go to destinations. So some people only uh, use the bicycle in the park. Some felt they were able to use a bicycle on the street and didn't own a bicycle. So they didn't use a bicycle also. And only four, so half of the eight respondents actually achieved the goal of the bicycle lessons, which was to actually use a bicycle for activity participation. And so the level of appropriation, you can look at the glass half full or half empty, 50% successful or 50% failure uh, of the lesson, if you look only at the ability to cycle. Now then if you use I look at those four respondents who actually started to use the bicycle, for what purpose do they use the bicycle? Now you see actually, and this is quite an achievement, that they use it for all kinds of activities. So it's not just for one purpose, but actually once you get into the mood of using the bicycle for one purpose, you start using it for more and more purposes. So it really becomes part of your choice set, and becomes a reasonable option to use. And the, when they didn't use it, there was no reason to use it. So the shop or the school was too close by the cycle. Uh, or they didn't bring their kids to activities, for instance. And you see that they don't not only use it actually to serve other people, so for shopping or to serve the kids, but also to participate in activities for themselves, uh, each of these women. And now, of the four women, only two actually participated in more activities after the bicycle lessons. And the two of them did not do so. And because either they were just simply too busy, and so although there were travel time savings, they were so small that it didn't allow them to do something else. They were working, and so there was no time left. They just had more time to work or to get home, but not to do something else. And the other two used more, much more, the bi uh, who did more activities, the bicycle was only part of the story. It was much more, and this was an important impact also of the bicycle lessons, the fact that they broadened their social network and they feel much more comfortable. They felt confident about themselves. If I can learn how to cycle, I can learn anything. And so they felt empowered by the bicycle lessons. And so the lessons were not really important in terms of physically being able to control the bicycle, but actually in terms of giving them self-esteem. And from the self-esteem also came the willingness and the courage to actually participate in activities. And some of these women actually became teachers themselves teaching other women how to cycle. Um, now why did you see that only half of those uh, respondents um, did not uh, learn, uh, did not use their bicycle in practice? Um, well, in many cases were personal circumstances. So one respondent became ill and so was hardly out of the house. And some people just, their lives were so full they didn't manage to find the time even to try it make it their practice. But there's also the question whether the bicycle lessons themselves are sufficiently good to actually prepare people to use the bicycle in everyday life. And actually from Angela's experience, in other cities, these were respondents from Amsterdam, actually in other cities the success of these cycle lessons are much higher. And so it might actually depend on the quality of the lessons. We didn't check this systematically, but actually it might be a question. And then there is the issue of the transportation conditions. In Amsterdam, both public transport is very good, so the need for a bicycle is much lower. <coughs> and ethnic minorities use public transport a lot for their travel. And though there are so many cyclists, that cycling is very scary if you just turn on a cycle. So the more cyclists there are, the more scary it is to cycle. My wife comes from Israel. When she started cycling at home, she said, I don't mind about the cars, it's the cyclists. <laughs> There's a problem of bicycle availability. It is not very obvious for these people to own a bicycle. Even if they own a bicycle, they usually live in houses where it's difficult to store a bicycle, and so there's bicycle theft. Or the bicycle breaks down and there's no money to repair it. Or they have a bicycle that actually the son of the house is using it, or the man is using it, so they don't have access to the bicycle. 
So if you don't provide the women also with the bicycle after the lessons, you might actually lose the whole goal of um, the lessons. And then there's of course the social cultural setting. To what extent is the environment of these women, the family, but also the broader uh, community they live in, supportive of cycling? Because it's still very uncommon for them to cycle, it's not common in their own countries. Conclusions, right? Um, Bicycle lessons do work, they can work better. Maybe empowerment is just as important as actually learning how to cycle. And maybe this is also where funding might come from, not just from transportation people, but also from other purposes. And I think if you want to roll this idea out of cycling lessons also to other countries, uh, we should systematically think about what kind of lessons do you need in different kind of conditions. Because uh, in different countries you will need different kind of bicycle lessons women or men to start using them. Um, and what is the role of the peer group in this? And how can you stimulate actually that there is a positive message around cycling so cycling can be adopted in practice after the visit?